We have Dina Buchanan on. Dina, I really appreciate your time. And uh, for those that are interested, I want you to follow along. Head over to pcrpgroup.com um, and join the uh, their Passive Investor Club. I mean, this, there's a lot of great content and great information there. Really appreciate your time, Dina. And we're going to jump into something pretty interesting here today as we talk about commercial investing, syndications, even e- ESG. Um, so mm-hmm. that's going to be a new term for, for a lot of people. But Dina, I really appreciate your time here today. Thanks so much for having me, JD. Pleasure to be here. So let's start things off because uh, a lot of people, you know, most real estate investing podcasts, I'm sure, have a lot of people cycling in and out. Uh, yeah. They may not be familiar with what ESG is. So let's start with that and define that quick. Perfect. Uh, environmental. Uh, social corporate governance. Um, one of the things that we've noticed um, at PCRP Group, our company, is you know my background a little bit. I've been investing for almost twenty years now. Um, started out residential, moved into commercial, um, and then moved into investing in other people's syndications. And um, my business partner and I um, have invested together as well. And one of the things that we have been aware of and looked at for a while is, well, how are how are these climate um, extremes affecting people's real estate values? And um, and they are. And what's more is upon, you know, studying further, it's very, very fascinating that a lot of people haven't been putting some of these things into their risk analysis, um, especially with the ongoing inclement weather that we're seeing, and it doesn't seem to be anything that's stopping anytime soon. Um, it's not necessarily the great debate of our time is what is probably climate risk or climate extreme. And that's not what we're exactly talking about. What we're talking about is how does it affect the investment? Like, let's look at the numbers. Let's look at the math on that. And are there places in the country where an investor would be better served um, with investing in specific markets that are much more what we call climate resilient, meaning fires, floods, earthquakes, hurricanes, um, even heat extremes can affect the investment from many, many, you know, if you just look at some of the, the weather we've had over the last summer, New Orleans, right? A perfect example, they could have a, even just a, a, a small storm can really affect the real estate there and the real estate values. Um, and upon further study, we're seeing insurance companies dropping coverage in some areas, um, which means one of two things. One, um, either they're going to have extreme, the people, the insurance companies that are going in there, people are going to see extreme rate hikes from the ones that are staying there. That's going to be more like a monopoly. And two, what we're seeing is from people like BlackRock and State Street Capital, not like looking at, you know, underwriting. And if you can't get it insured, how is that going to affect underwriting? And being in a syndication for five years, seven years, sometimes 10 years, if you're going into some of those opportunity markets, right? We're seeing that, gosh, if we, if, if an investor is in one of these markets and let's say it's, you know, just Miami beach, right? On the beach, that is going to have, be in one of those areas that could be very much affected. We're not saying that it will be, but it's got a higher probability than, let's say, Orlando, Florida, right? Mm-hmm. Because of the proximity to um, the storm's effectiveness. So in a nutshell, that's really what started us down this path. And what we've started seeing is we were absolutely right. And there's a huge advantage uh, financially to be in a more climate resilient market um, from an underwriting standpoint, from an insurance standpoint, from an expense standpoint. Well, I usually find that most people that you you know you're talking about a niche here that mm-hmm. is 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 well, it's very niche. I mean, it, it, is. it, yeah. it and, yeah. and but but usually that starts with some sort of passion or background associated with that. Is that where this started? How did you how did you come about going down this road? Well, it's just something that I I would say I definitely have a passion for, um, you know, being much more environmentally conscious, right? Um, So I started to be aware of it more from looking at those things. And um, I live in Florida. So 
I see the beach and have been part of many beach cleanups and, and things that were passionate uh, to me on that realm as well. Um, but what really drove it is that passion to look, but then just doing the math. I mean, when we just did the math on it, we're like, just from a pure investment standpoint, regardless of if, if people follow my belief system or not, that's not really the point. The point is financially in some of these riskier markets, you're going to see some, some um, things that are in, in the next couple of years. I mean, BlackRock um, and, and some financial companies, major financial companies are already putting it in their underwriting um, not only to look at, hey, are we going to fund company XYZ in this deal based on their risk analysis without having any you know, climate resiliency in there? And then also they're going to look at, hey, their portfolio that they have, what's in that? And is that uh, in risky areas? Because if this part of the ship goes down, this part of the ship's probably going to go down too. So mm-hmm. we're looking at you know, some bigger people, bigger players in this game. And and that's where it really got us like, whoa, we've got to take a look at this. Um, and as an investor who my business partner, Lori Centrelli and I, we invest in these syndications with our investors. So it's all of our money. And we want to make sure that everybody gets taken care of to the best of our ability. Mm-hmm. So just to clarify then, are you managing a syndication yourself or are you seeking out syndications and, and helping people invest? We are, man, we are kind of, you've got your sponsor. So we work directly with a sponsor and our group raises capital for that sponsor for those projects. So the projects and the sponsors that we align with, with those projects, they have to meet our requirements for our investors when it comes to ESG and climate resiliency. Sure. Well, can you talk a little bit about what those what those items are that you're checking off to make sure that they, they meet your requirements? For sure. So one, we definitely like to be in a climate resilient market. So nothing coastal, nothing where we've got extreme weather conditions. So let me say this. We all be investing in my backyard is what you're saying. Well, someplace where it would definitely be much more climate friendly, right? Um, Even in my backyard, if you think about it, Florida, right? So Central Florida, yes, but maybe coastal, not so much. Um, you know, places where there would be extreme weather. That's the first thing that we would look at is, um, and keeping in mind this, that even in Orlando, Florida, where I live in Windermere, which is right outside of Orlando, and we could have in climate weather here. We're not saying that. We could have major storms here, but the the probability of it affecting an investment or a building in Orlando compared to on the beach, right? We're not saying it's going to never happen, but we're mitigating that risk greatly. So that's the number one thing. Um, We look for area. The other thing that we look at is working with sponsors that are more environmentally conscious with using some uh, green materials. One, because the tax benefits and keeping in mind that when someone's part of a syndication, they're essentially they own a percentage. They've got some equity in that asset, right? So the tax advantages that investors get are those that are a lot like an owner gets, right? So if they're using environmentally friendly materials, um, if they're paying attention to appliances, um, uh, materials for flooring, painting outside materials that are going to make it more eco-friendly, there's a huge tax benefit for that. So we also look for that. Um, Mm -hmm. And operators that are going to, we usually will work with class B. We like multifamily because multifamily, it reduces the carbon footprint um, for us, um, all of us. And if you think about, you know, everything from if we've got a multifamily uh, property and maybe it's a class B, which is what we really like, because then we do have that upside for our investors, for ourselves, the sponsor, we can go in and make those changes what we found is was really interesting. Even when we're, we're looking at making the changes in the renovations, doing it more eco-friendly or doing more green materials is, is not really that, that much more expensive, if at all. In fact, when you factor in the tax benefits, it could be less. And that just puts more in the investor's pocket, right? And the sponsor mm-hmm. as well. So it's a win-win. So those would be the three main things that we would look for. So are you saying that when you get involved in a project, you you have enough incentive to to talk to that talk to the 
syndication and and make suggestions and and push in in certain directions to help mitigate some of this? We 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 could do that, but mainly what we found is the sponsors that align with our principles are really it's it's just those are the those are the people that that we align with. So they're already doing those things. Um, I'd love to take credit for that kind of influence, but I think. You know, I think the that the match, you know, the like mindedness, um, you know, putting, you know, your principles and your profits together. Right. And and seeing how how that can really help the whole um, and, and do some good for ourselves. And it's what we call uh, doing good as well as you're doing well. Right. So, you know, I, I think a lot of people would be curious then, you know, uh, you've already mentioned the tax incentives that could be beneficial from these type of projects. What type of other kind of returns or benefits would somebody see versus a traditional syndication? Well, I think that, I don't know that it would be necessarily a direct benefit of the syndication, but the project itself. So if the project is getting it using materials and and the cost going in is less um, and they get tax credits, that's just going to put more money in the pot for all the investors who are are part owner. But with all real estate investing, if you think about it, um, you've got depreciation, you know, uh, which is amazing, um, where you can appropriate it over time with, you know, 39 and a half years for commercial and 26 or 27 years for residential. Um, And that's probably a huge piece, um, I think, of value with real estate. But also from a business perspective, if somebody, um, you know, one of the bigger pieces is probably their income. So if they can reduce the tax liability for that as well, um, and syndications can also provide that for, for their investors too. So right. it's, it's the cool thing about a syndication, I think, uh, from, be, you know, being in syndications, many of them, um, we got to have the money go work for us, right? With the beautiful tax benefits, um, and not doing having to be so hands on on the work, so I think sure. that's really a big attractiveness to what we do. Sure. So you're you're basically saying that it's it's the asset class that might be appealing, not necessarily that it's a higher return rate than. I think both. I think the asset class and the fact that by going into these markets, we've already got. Um, a plan that allows the investor to mitigate a lot of that risk. Like the bigger piece I think to look at is, well, let's say somebody's in a a syndication and it's a five-year syndication, five to seven years is about average. And maybe they did this syndication coastal or they did it in a a flood zone. Um, And then all of a sudden the underwriters come in and say, Hey, listen, we're not, we're not underwriting in here anymore. And that sponsor has all those investors, their dollars in that syndication in that market, and they can't get it underwritten or insurance goes up, which means that's going to take more money out of the profits and the proceeds for the investors. So those I think are really where we see some of the biggest changes in in choosing the markets that we do, as well as on top of that, choosing a class B where there's an upside. So like Class A, when we have a market shift, we tend to see those properties go down to a B. And just it, it's really a matter of age, as I'm sure you're aware. Mm-hmm. You know, 10 to 20 years is a class B. So we've got more upside for our investors when we focus on those markets because they're in really good neighborhoods usually. Um, they've got they're attached to some of the better school zones. They're probably better centrally located. They've got some amenities around them, uh, public transportation, things like that. Um, so those have a good upside. So we do focus in those areas on those things. And those are things probably traditional investors and syndications would focus on as well. But I think it's the markets too, that we go in the sponsors that we work with. So it's a combination of all of these things, kind of like a dovetail, right? On a drawer. Mm -hmm. Sure. So just a reminder for everybody, uh, better take advantage of this, head head over to pcrpgroup.com and join the Passive Investor Club. Uh, like I mentioned before, there's a lot of great content there and sent out pretty regularly. So uh, yeah. this is this is a great resource. Definitely. So let's say somebody is interested in in uh-huh. joining a a group like yours and and taking part of a syndication or a project mm-hmm. like this. Are there questions or or 
things that they should consider, questions they should be asking to make sure it's a good fit? Absolutely. You know, I actually did a um, an educational video on this that we're going to release and we're doing an educational series. Um, and my background is I've been in real estate education um, for the last probably 17 years. I've been speaking and teaching people across the country. And one of the big things I say is number one is, is the company a fit, right? And you'll know, you'll, you start to look at, do, do they align with my principles with investing? How do, you know, from everything from where do they choose their deals to um, what kind of markets are they in? Um, for us, ESG, you know, are they environmentally friendly? Do, are, are they conscious about that? Who's on their team? You know, if that's important to you, you know, what, what are their backgrounds and, and what are they, you know, what are their, what have they done? What's their experience level? Big time. Um, we only work with sponsors that have been in the industry, you know, for a number of years, at least I would say, you know, 10 or more and have a track record of um, having good opportunities they've presented to their investors. They've had a good track record of being successful. Have they ever had a capital call? You know, where, where are the investors? And that happens, no judgment, it does. But um, if you start to see a pattern where, hey, this happened on several deals, that means there might be a little cog in that wheel, right? Pay attention to that. And I would say overall, um, don't discount ever your gut, right? When you're talking with somebody, and you're, you're getting a feel for them. It doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad person. It doesn't mean that their deal is bad. It just might not be the fit for you. And, and your, you know, your gut tells you that, you know, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a big piece there. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, since you've had experience now in, in residential properties, all the way yeah. up to commercial apartments, I'd like to give some people like some actionable items that they can maybe take away and leverage today. Sure. Um, and, and a lot of them are going to be in that single family home rental yeah. properties. Are there anything that you can think of right now that they could maybe take advantage of right off the bat? You already talked about some tax incentives or a few other mm -hmm. things, anything that they should possibly consider in when they're buying a new single family home rental property, a little upgrade. Sure. You know, it's so interesting. One of the things I've seen trending and a really dear friend of mine, uh, he and his wife, they work in, uh, in South Carolina. One of the things that we've seen trending is a lot of uh, shorter term rentals, vacation rentals. Whenever people think of vacation rentals, they were thinking of like the beach, right? So for residential, what we've noticed is even in Orlando, like in the city, which I had not ever really seen as, as prevalent before as I'm seeing now, but people are, are, are leaning towards those vacation rentals more. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, especially if they're coming to a place like Walt Disney World, right? So it makes sense for Orlando, like, wow, and you're coming with kids. Well, big kids go too. We all go, right? But, you know, little mm -hmm. kids might be gr more family friendly if they have got a kitchen and they've got, you know, some extra room for the family to be in. Um, as a mom myself, I've got two kids and when they were smaller, they're, they're 13 and 17 now, but even still, when we travel with them and we travel quite a bit with them, we like to get a place where we've got a small kitchen because I've got my third, my son, 13, she, he wakes up starving. Like he's sitting on the floor. He's got to have food. Mm -hmm. Can't wait to go get something to eat. Right. And mom's got to have her coffee right away. So things like that, um, for families, I think are really cool to look into and, let's talk numbers for a minute, like about this. So if somebody is renting out a single family home and they're doing short term, number one, you're going to have less landlord issues just mm -hmm. overall, because the people are there, they're on vacation. Very, very rare that there would be major damage done by like where somebody could experience with a long-term tenant. I've, I've had short term, I mean, I've had long-term rentals, single family, so it can happen. The other thing is the amount of rent that these things can make in a month is astronomical compared to just a monthly rent. So if you had a, let's say you had a two bedroom, two bath condo that rented for 1600 a month as a long-term rental, it could rent for 16 or 1800 a week for a mm -hmm. short-term rental. So basically, if you think about it, if it was occupied, oh, sorry about that, and it was rented for the month, 
that's like one month is like four months short-term rent. So a lot of times the shorter term rentals, if you're in an area like that, um, can make as much, can pay for themselves within a three to four month time period for the Mm -hmm. whole year. And then the rest of the year is all profit. So that's something I would, I don't know if people are looking at, but it was something unique that I heard Mm -hmm. that might be something really cool if you're in that type of an area. Yeah, Um, no, and I've I've been seeing, um, uh, you know, maybe it's my area, but I'm seeing more and more larger you know, commercial places, apartment buildings, yep. they, they always have, you know, X amount percent that, Correct. that are vacant. Well, uh, some of them are now setting a few units aside as exactly that they're, they're making yep. them uh, short-term rentals and just as experiments, just to see, you know, especially near the colleges and a few other things. It's, you know, one of my best friends um, is going to see her son who goes to Auburn and she rented because they're going with the younger siblings and, and her husband and, and some of the grandparents are coming too. And it's his first year away. So everybody's coming up that weekend. I don't know if he's ready for it, but they're all coming mm-hmm. and they rented an Airbnb, you know, that was just, you know, they rented a, a sh- and I don't know if it was Airbnb, but it was more of a short-term rental that was locally managed and it was close to his dorm and close to the campus. And so we're seeing a lot of that now. Um, I think too, a lot of this changed due to COVID because mm-hmm. I think when people were wanting to go and still get out, even though, you know, it was a, right. it was a danger for some for COVID, you know, they wanted to do it safe as they could. And they wanted to be someplace where they had some space if they had to be inside. So I've, sure. I've seen that a lot. Well, you know, to, to kind of go back to the environment friendly type incentives too, is that mm-hmm. one of the thing, you know, for the apartments and, and uh, single family home rentals, I've seen some people take advantage of, you know, smart thermostats and stuff. Some of the local yes. electric companies will give you some benefits and credits there in order yep. to, and and having those type of little updates actually incentivize pe- some of your renters from coming too. I mean, it's, it's amazing what little things you can take yep. advantage of, and it doesn't really cost you a lot, but it's a significant update upgrade for your residents. Big time. If you think about just, um, you know, when you're doing refitting, you know, bathrooms and commodes and uh, appliances, you know, environmentally friendly appliances that use less energy, solar, solar power, especially if you're coming someplace where it's, where it's hot, um, huge benefit for renters. They love those types of things. The other thing it does on, from, we, we look at it from the dollar standpoint, but think about from the emotional standpoint, from a renter, you brought up a good point. If they see that, hey, this person really cares about the property and they really, that means they care about me, right? And that mm-hmm. means that, hey, if they care about their property and I have an issue, they're going to take care of it. So from a single family, and I think that's true across the board, whether it's a apartment building, a syndication, you know, if they know, if, if your clients know Hey, they, I matter to these people and they care about me. They're just going to, they're going to stay in your, your houses longer. They're going to rent their unit longer. The leases are going to go longer and they're happier and happy tenants pay on time and stay and don't destroy properties. Right. And they all, you know, all those things. Right. No, this has been a great conversation. Just, uh, just as a reminder, one last time, head over to pcrpgroup.com and join the passive investor club. Uh, a lot of great content there. Uh, Dina, I really appreciate your time here this week. This has been really enlightening. Um, and uh, you know, I was going to ask you one last question is, <laughs> is there a question you wished I would have asked you here today? Well, if somebody wanted to know how to get more personalized investment advice of so somebody out there that's listening, that's an accredited investor that wants to know a little bit more about whether it's PCRP um, syndication investing, um, would they enjoy having a conversation with me? They absolutely can if they choose to. And if you go on to pcrpgroup.com, you can actually book a call with me or you can send me an email um, if you have any questions um, or you want to learn more um, because we're available for the personal touch as well. No, take take uh, Dina up on this. Uh, there's a lot. We, we just really touch the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this. And, and I didn't mean to, to make that 
a pun, but I guess it is when we were talking about <laughs> <Yes>. environmental extremes. <laughs> but he's good like that. He gets it. So I really appreciate it, Dina. This was a great conversation. You're welcome back anytime if you want to chat about Thank something, you. because I, I also to. think that you and I could spend an entire episode talking about mindset and, and that type of thing, too. Oh, we totally could. That's so one of my jams. I mean, I, you know, I always joke that before I was a real estate investor in my former life, I was um, personal development, uh, teacher, coach, life coach, mental health counseling, psychology degree. So love that. It's it's everything that we do. It's, it's everything. Yeah. I, it, it's, it's such a, that, that almost seems to be something that you have to get right first before anything else. hundred percent. Can't do anything if your mind's not in the right place. Right. Right. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. And we'll talk again You're soon. So welcome. Thank you very much for having me.